Hey there, folks. Rel here. Welcome back to another episode of uh, our little podcast. A little, little, little podcast time. <laughs> That's lovely. Uh, today we're going to ask, or maybe hopefully answer, how you keep a game from fizzling out during periods of drought, maybe. Uh, rather, just uh, how do you keep a game in somebody's headspace? John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it right over here to you because you have so much more experience running uh, campaigns, long, long-term long campaigns, short-term campaigns, just the game in general, I think, uh, than I do. So what sorts of situations do you encounter that could cause uh, fizzling in the first place? I, I have run a lot of ongoing campaigns, and I've actually completed a good number of kind of longer campaigns too, but I have definitely had way more campaigns fizzle than I've had end. And when I, when I say fizzle, um, what I mean is that there isn't one big identifiable point where we're like, ah, this game is just done. Like, it's not like two players had an argument at the table and now they just won't show up. It's usually like, hey, we're trying to schedule the next session. And for some reason, it just never happens again. Um, and I, I find that that usually happens because the player playing their character usually get some kind of emotional distance from them. And usually that ends up being a structural thing. So for example, if you have like say a weekly game where you play for two hours and then pause in the middle and then pick up next time, um, if it doesn't feel like there's meaningful progress toward an objective, like you're just kind of meandering through a dungeon. In my experience, a lot of especially narrative minded players um, will get bored more They'll just keep getting more bored and bored and they they won't feel like their character is moving towards some kind of catharsis. Um, or if, like you said, there's a large amount of time in between sessions, what can happen is there the player had a certain level of excitement when the last game ended, but they're having a hard time feeling how they were feeling when the last session ended, which makes it harder to pick up. And because it's harder to pick up, they're less enthused about continuing, which more often than not just means that the game never ends up continuing. If you're letting games fall through, that uh, that might be a problem in and of itself. I don't know if if um, if like forcing a game night every however often uh, will work for every table, but I've certainly seen it suggested. Like, okay, we're going to play as long as there's a player at the table and the, the game's just going to move on. And you can certainly design your campaigns to be done in such a way. I think you do this too, actually, where if you have a start, beginning, and end, and wrap it up all in the, the same session, that it doesn't really matter what happens in between for for those, or rather, if the players aren't necessarily on stage the next time a game uh, comes around. So what, why don't you um, talk a little bit about how you handle your your current uh, ongoing campaigns. One of the things I noticed as uh, as a professional game master, because uh, a lot of where my early experience started is we had a brick and mortar business um, that was a family education center. And I was one of a team of game masters whose job position at the center was to run TTRPGs. And one of the things I noticed really early on is that when you had a more traditional game structure with you know, a set group of people that would come in weekly and play for two hours, pause in the middle and then leave. Um, they ended up being less excited and remembering less than players who would play these almost one shot style games where yeah. you'd show up with the same character. But like you said, it was more like the episode of a TV show where there was a new problem that was introduced. Uh, the team of players would go in and sometimes, you know, the actual roster would rotate. But whatever the problem was, was resolved and concluded uh, by the end of that session. And like a TV show, sometimes there would be, you know, little lore drops or hints about something else going on in either another part of the world or another part of the town or whatever that the players could investigate next time. But they ended up just remembering better. And I think it's because there weren't as many open loops left open at the end of a session. So, you know, from in my personal experiences that were non-professional, I ended up trying the same rhythm and it worked really, really well for my particular players. Because like you said, I do have a particular style. I just found after like playing with 50 or so different players, 
about 40 of them were more narrative minded. About 10 of them were more what you'd expect from like uh, dungeon crawl type games. So yeah, it is definitely a personal preference. Yeah, I'm definitely one of those people that I, I really like the long campaigns because I, I like my characters, you know, and I, I want to see them continue on with the story. And I kind of want to live every moment um, as long as it feels like there's something that I could be doing. So, but, but that is, I think on the, on the spectrum of ease of access um, and, and reliability, this is on the total other side where you, you already have to have an established group that that knows and wants and respects how to play that way in order for those things to keep going because if you try it with just like anybody it's going to fall apart so that's where i think that your style of play seems more like the that gateway entry point and is more just reliable for the most uh, amount of players uh, but you do stuff in between sessions too so um my one like build off of what you just said is you also need players that not only understand and can follow through on that, but also just are in the season of their life where they're like available. So for example, I was playing a game more like what you were just describing uh, during the pandemic when nobody was doing anything. We like, we almost had a a game Monday through Friday every night for a while. And I kind of burned myself out a little players were able to commit a lot more then. Um, And then come last year, you know, everyone's asking me to run the same kind of game. But then I was like, all right, well, what night is everyone available? And no one was. (laughs) So they wanted that same kind of like long built up experience. But if nobody's available to play, you can't play. Um, So to actually answer your question, um, one of the things that came out of that pandemic time was um, after a session would close, individual players would contact me and ask what their character could be doing in between missions or in between episodes. And we started calling them in betweens. Um, This was largely player driven. Um, This wasn't something I asked for, Uh, but they would just say, you know, I want to go on a date with a random NPC that I created. Um, And largely I was more acting in terms of an editor than as a director they would come with ideas Uh, every now and again, there'd be some kind of lore discrepancy that I would have to reconcile with them. Um, But yeah, they were able to create these really meaningful pockets of, uh, of story in between the episodes that we were playing together. So giving, um, you know, people, I mean, I don't want to call it homework because it seems like uh, when they're doing the in-betweens, they can kind of commit as much or as little as they want. And it seemed like that was coming from them in the first place to like, Hey, I want this to be happening to my character. Uh, and being able to maintain your campaign, your games, your table, whatever in that headspace in between all the times when you're not sitting down and interacting face to face is a, it's a, it's a part of, um, keeping a game alive that I do think can be designed for can certainly be planned for, uh, like you described. And I think that there are already some functions in games that that do that. So when I think about uh, Dungeons and Dragons in particular, on D&D Beyond, which I use a lot, well, used to use uh, a lot, I've been playing D&D less, uh, just the character creation. Much like the character creation facet of a video game is super exciting to me uh, because it holds a lot of possibility, I would frequently engage with D&D Beyond because I liked seeing what characters could be because the the multitude of rules and the ways that you can design them and and it's self-driven you don't need a gm there you don't need a table there you don't even need to play the characters unfortunately because i have 50 characters chilling in my D beyond that i you know will never get to play but uh having systems like that uh or maybe just a compelling game in the first place that invites players to be in the driver's seat i guess um is something uh, that you you can design for uh before i go into some more of my stuff do you have any thoughts on on that yeah just something i want to clarify um is i also my, my table plays a very um non-typical uh way of interacting with the game so we do a live play by post where rather than you know talking as you normally would imagine a, a ttrpg we type all of our characters actions uh through an online uh, VTT. Um, And the reason why we do that 
is first of all, because we find that gathering at a physical location, it adds a lot of time. I found that this particular group of players has a, a harder time focusing. But the other side is that everything gets documented, which makes it easier for players to go back and figure out very specific story details or NPC names or magic items or whatever. And because they're free to go back through the records, they are more likely to for their headspace to live in the game in between sessions, like you said. And so when we do the in-betweens, it's not like a solo session where I'm sitting down with one player and we're talking back and forth. It's just a Google Doc and they write out their adventure like a short story, which isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea. They were able to do it on their own. And basically when they wrote their portion, they would ask me to check it over to see if it was all right before they continued building off of it. So it was like a very specific tool designed for a very specific type of gameplay. I I do think that you can designed for it in your system as well. And this is something that I'm excited about. Um, Currently, I'm working on a system that's called Intermissions or Offline Adventures. It's very lightweight, very uh, self-guided. You'll normally, you'll sit down for a session, you'll play through your your game, and then you'll do the combat and everything is very live and, and in person. But in between those times, that the rest of the month, you know, that you're waiting for a game, instead of having a game fall through, what if the GM was able to say, all right, everybody, there's a season that's going to pass in between uh, when we ended our last adventure and where we're going to pick up the next one. What are your characters doing during that time? So while you have uh, your in-betweens that kind of can bridge that gap, I was looking to create a more structured uh, approach for Distal, uh, the, the system that I'm designing. So these intermissions are prompt based in that you determine what you want to do with the time that you have and you'll you'll fill, a, fill in a prompt saying this is the activity that I want to devote some time to and then some of those activities will be inherently more risky than others. Uh, you can be gathering information, you could be practicing a skill or learning a new one, you could be trying to contact uh, other well, contacts that you you have associated with your your character, you could be going to a distant place to resolve some sort of conflict and then you roll on on a table that's kind of like the an outcome or a response to the activity that you're attempting to do which kind of gives a little bit of chaos and unpredictability to that that experience and you as the player do the interpretation of this is what my character wanted to do they're researching information because they need to learn about this the bloodline of this you know person that um, is causing us a bunch of problems and how they're going to do that is it, maybe they'll be digging through archives or maybe they'll be spying on that person's retinue to try to find some uh, informant and you you were given the pieces and this is the interpretation that you come up with so then when you roll on the table and it says that you uh, you get into a scuffle which causes a combat encounter you you have a couple of options depending on how hard you want to commit. You can either run the combat encounter and design the combat encounter, and we give you tools to do that. There's an encounter generator. There's a battlefield generator. There's um, guidance on uh, building encounters themselves. You you can go through and structure everything yourself, and then you tell the GM like, hey, this is what I did. This is how it turned out, and this is where I'm at. Or you can kind of fade to black. So if you fade to black. Uh, and this would happen if you were to, to fall unconscious anyway, you know, if the combat were to go sideways. And then you, you figure out what happens narratively to your character. Do they get captured? Do they get uh, saved by uh, you know, people who are passing by? Ultimately, you've created this very short story for yourself that you can then send off to your, your GM and have a conversation about it. And the point is to keep people engaged in the game uh, without having to sit down at the table. And hopefully this, this sort of self-guided experience is fun. It's uh, hopefully it's above board in that it's you know formalized in the rules. It also helps lean into a lot of the collaborative uh, world building that I've structured distal with in the first place. It's not supposed to be just like GM is you know king or queen or whatever. And they're giving you, like force feeding you a campaign. No, it's more collaborative than that. The players are going to be coming up with 
locations via the location generator that they may you know put in front of the player or the the gm rather and then the gm can figure out how that works in that world but it's all a conversation and i'm giving you the tools to facilitate it so again very excited about this uh, idea i don't think it's where i want it to be um, we're going to beta test it the beta is going to drop at the end of the very end of july and uh and i've gotten a really a bunch of really good feedback about it so far in the development discord but um want to bring it further yeah i mean the best reference i have for something like that is what you did with backgrounds that prompt generator and i've said many times that's one of my favorite parts of distal's character creation is just the sheer surprise of seeing what complications or contacts uh, get added to kind of discover a character through the character creation process and it's also again not so specific that sometimes it doesn't make sense because Distal is not the first game to have kind of a background generator with tables, but it's by far the best one that I've experienced. Um, so I have full faith in the prompt aspect of it, um, especially if it's going to be in line like the character generator. The The other possibility that's always been fun with in-betweens and maybe something to consider as you're developing um, the prompts is one of the things that TTRPG sessions can't do as well as other traditional stories is have uh, scenes with one or two characters. So some of the most meaningful um, story moments that we have in whatever media you want is when, you know, two characters can be alone and have like a heart to heart or a moment of honesty or a moment of meaning. And you can do it at the table, but it feels weird having all of the players present, but not their characters present. And then there's a question of what does my character know versus what do I know as the player. Um, and so another thing that happened with the in-betweens that you may structure through a system like this is, you know, uh, very early on, we had two characters argue over what to do with an artifact because it was either give it to a devil and save the city, but maybe have a bigger problem to deal with later, or we don't give artifacts to devils because they'll do worse things with it. But it's like, but then the city will blow up. So, um, so there is this argument between two characters in one of my sessions. And rather than resolve it there, I, we just kind of resolved it. The artifact got to the devil, but afterward I was able to have an in-between with those two characters where they could really hash it out without taking up a lot of time at the table and without the intrusion of other player characters where it wasn't really their moment to have uh, any sort of interjection. So it could be that, you know, if you miss a session because someone's gone, you can run one of these side adventures um, to create that moment of meaning between two characters. And then the, the only hiccup I could see is you mentioned like a season in between two sessions. I, I could imagine this would be hard to do if, say, like you ended one session with a cliffhanger where you're about to enter the boss room. There's for not sure. really time for like a like a whole yeah, yeah. scene in between, but um, that's like a, a very edge case. Yeah, so we have um, basically the GM would say, okay, how much time do we actually have? I totally imagine that, like you said, if there's like a cliffhanger, you're you're not going to be able to run an intermission. You got to bite the bullet and just like run the the actual game to get it across the finish line. Yeah, no, I think that's that's all um, legit. I don't have any specific rules right now for people doing their intermission together. So I think that's something that I do need to account for because there's no there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to to do that. Um, the intermissions do give you space to kind of be off doing your own thing, but um, but that won't always be desirable either. So so on top of that, like intermissions, you design that into, into the the game. The in betweens, it's something that you can keep people uh, engaged with uh, with the game as well. One other way that and this is a little bit more. Um, meta i guess is that when there is information about your system um so dnd has been releasing all sorts of content for you know uh 2024 edition of dungeons and dragons coming out and just by virtue of having uh youtube videos show up in your feed i think that that on some level keeps people engaged with the the system and then kind of a trickle down effect is that probably your campaign as well which is that little uh seed of like, hey, there's a reminder that this game still exists, it lets you come back to these characters and the moments of the campaigns or whatever, so that you can further them in, in your mind. So the supplemental content, I think, is really important for the whole ecosystem of keeping a, a campaign and a, a game going. 
Absolutely. Um, this might be tangential, but I was thinking a lot about why D and D is so popular. Um, and I do think that a significant part of it is it just helps search algorithms better. Like content creators who have played many different TTRPGs have said in some of their videos, like I have to put D and D in the thumbnail or I have to put D and D in the title so that my video doesn't get buried. Um, and because of that, like the D and D brand lives in the headspace of players more often than not. So even if we don't really want to talk about it, we kind of end up talking about it. Um, so especially uh, because the last time we talked was about the resiliency of the hobby. That is something to consider as part of the resilience. I, it's, a, it's a cycle that feeds in on itself as well, where popularity breeds popularity. And it's, it's almost an insurmountable task to kind of usurp that, you know, dethrone, I guess, you know, Dungeons and Dragons in that respect. So you can use it to help kind of accelerate some other games. You know, you said people have to put D and D in, in, in their thumbnails um, or like, you know, in hashtags in the titles or just make references to, to D and D even in videos that aren't necessarily uh, about it. Like you could be talking about a system and then people will immediately ask like, okay, how's it different than D and D? You know, that's always going to be the case. If you do see a video that does seem like it'll be helpful uh, to your table, um, just by sharing it with your friends and having conversations about TTRPGs at large, it, it'll keep them together. I, I largely, I think, attribute the success of my latest game and why it's gone on for four years to that part. Um, the other campaigns I've run haven't had a group chat like that, again, because when I was running a professional game, I didn't want to like ask people for their phone numbers or send them Facebook messages. That was just weird and unprofessional. But if it's just my friends, you know, having a D&D &D chat and sending them memes or, you know, sending advice about character builds or character flaws or whatever, um, it just keeps the conversation going, which reminds them of how awesome the hobby is, which makes them want to play again, even if a particular campaign fizzles. Uh, I think that's... Pretty much wraps it up. If you have any uh, topic ideas, totally feel free to throw those in the comment section down below. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.